easy words to sing. We know them well. We can all sing them. But, you know, do we mean them when we do sing them? And, you know, I've got to ask myself that question. I'm not, and, you know, friends, anything I say this morning comes to me first. Any preacher, any speaker, anybody who wants to pass on a message or anything like that, if it doesn't have some challenge or bearing in their heart before they deliver it, there's no point in doing it. But I have a wee question for you, first of all. This, you know, this might be a wee bit different than your normal Sunday morning ministry. I hope it is. But it might be a wee bit different. And I'm just going to want, ask you, first of all, a simple question. Those of, those of you who are very spiritual, I'm only joking, you'll uh, understand straight away what I'm on about. And Aaron, don't put up the scripture readings yet, please, because that would give it away. Do you want to be a caterpillar or a butterfly? Jillian's looking at me, puzzled. Sorry, Jillian, I'm picking out you again. I told you it'd be a wee bit different. Do you want to be a caterpillar or do you want to be a butterfly? We'll come to that a wee bit later. Are you content with your service for God? Are you, are you content with your life, the life that you're living for God? If you are content with it, if everything's great, if you're serving the Lord to the very best of your ability, well then, friends, this message isn't for you this morning. It's not for you. But you know, many of us have been challenged as we have watched the radical DVD by David Platt. Yes, we've been challenged because the DV is called radical. And a few people have said, it shouldn't be called radical. It should be called normal. It's the way it should be. Because we shouldn't be just, just that tag of a Christian. We should be followers of Christ. Many in this church have been challenged by that radical DVD. Many I know in this church are seeking and are looking to God for a deeper walk with God. I know that because I've talked to them. And I know that. We have been challenged, but we need to be changed. I'm sick to the back teeth of people always saying, and even myself saying, oh, you know, that was a great message. That was a great word. What a challenge. And we leave it at that. Friends, the Word of God must challenge us. By the Holy Spirit, it must challenge us. But by the Holy Spirit, we must be changed. We must be people who do something about it. We can't be like those in James where it says, you look into a mirror, you see how you are, and you go away and you just forget all about it. Yes, it's good to be challenged, but we must be changed. And this is what this message is all about. In Romans 12, verses 1 to 2, God asks us to do two things. And we're going to read those verses just in a moment or two. We're asked to do two things. God is only asking us to do two things. And this is the crux of the whole matter. Present our bodies as a living sacrifice. That means not just your body, but everything you are, your members, your faculties, everything that you are, the real person that you are. Present it all, a living sacrifice to God. And then in verse 2, to be transformed, to be changed by the renewing of your mind. Now, we're going to read those verses together. And just to be different this morning, we're going to read these two verses. The reading's not long. So we're going to read these verses from five different translations of the Bible. Just so as we get the gist of what we're talking about. Okay. Romans 12, 1 to 2. And first of all, now, Aaron will be able to give you the readings for four of them. We don't have the fifth one, so you'll just have to listen carefully to that. King James Version. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Then we go to the New International Version. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, 
in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Then we're going to read it from the Amplified Bible. It will probably not all come up, maybe. I'm not sure, but anyway. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, your rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world or this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in His sight for you. Then we move to the New Living Translation. This is the one that we don't have. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all He has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind He will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship Him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And then finally, yes, the English Standard Version. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, in the center of each one of those readings, each one of those readings from each different version, we have a different statement. The King James says, which is your reasonable service? The NIV says, this is your true and proper worship. The Amplified says, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship? The NLT says, this is truly the way to worship Him. And the ESV says, which is your spiritual worship? Four out of the five translations we have read together mention this word, worship. Worship. Presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice to God is the highest form of worship that we can render. Nothing says, I love you to the Lord, like a surrendered, consecrated, dedicated, holy life. Friends, I know we sing songs, we sing worship songs, we worship, we praise, we do all those things. But if we truly, really want to worship God, we need to dedicate, we need to give our lives as a living sacrifice to God. We need these minds renewed. Every single one of us, we need to change the way we think about things. And this is our spiritual, true spiritual act of worship. The King James says your reasonable service, but friends, you don't get the true, real meaning of it. It's an act of worship. That's what it's all about. If you want to truly worship God, give your life, give your body, your faculties, everything you have, give it on the altar to God and be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind. If you want to truly be a worshiper of God, if we want to be true worshipers of God, that's what we have to do. The challenge. Yes, it's a challenge. We're called to present, to offer our bodies. This means the whole person. I've said that. The word present means to place at one's disposal. We need to take these bodies, these lives, everything we have, and present them at God's disposal. Lord, here I am, everything I have, all there is of me, I present it to you for your service. When we 
I think Ali said this morning in the prayer meeting, a quote, when we die to self, the will of God is resurrected in our lives. And that's what it's all about. If you really, and people talk a lot about the will of God. How do I know the will of God? And how, do you know how you'll know the will of God? Present your body to God as a living sacrifice. Be renewed, transformed in your mind, and you will know the will of God. That will make it all crystal clear to you. The idea here is total surrender to God. It's not a matter of putting a wee bit on the altar. Far too many of us want to be saved. We want to enjoy the blessings of salvation. We want to enjoy all that, but we don't want to lay all on the altar for God. Lord, take so much, but there's wee compartments, there's rooms in my life that, Lord, I don't want you into. And let's be honest, that's the way it works. Let's be honest about it. We are guilty of holding back areas of our lives that are precious to us. What areas of your life is God not allowed allowed into? What areas of your life is God not allowed into? God wants it all. God wants it all. The tense you suggests a one time for all, time action, once for all. Give it all to Him. You may ask why God would think He can control every aspect of our lives. Why, 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 what right has God to ask that of us? The reason is simply because He bought us at Calvary. We've been remembering His death. He bought us at Calvary. If you're saved this morning, you're bought with a price, the precious blood of Christ. We belong to Him. It's as simple as that. We no longer belong to ourselves. We belong to God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. That's what the Word of God says, 1 Corinthians 19 and 20. Since that is true, we have no rights. We live in a world where everybody's talking about their rights. I have a right to this, and I have a right to that, and a right to something else. We have no rights before God. We've given those rights up, or we should have given those rights up, to a God who has bought us with the precious blood of His Son. We are supposed to be subject to His commands regardless of what they are. May we never forget that we were headed to hell. That's our destination. Before we were saved, we were on our way to hell. He chose us. He called us. He convicted us. He even gave us the faith that we were saved by. The saving faith that we had that night, that day, when we were drawn to the Lord. He gave us that saving faith. So He owns us. It seems to me, I don't know whether you'll agree or not. I don't care whether you agree or not. Because this is what the Word of God teaches. It seems to me that we owe Him everything. Now, you might go out of this meeting this morning, you might say, well, that wasn't, what's he talking about? That's not for me. But friends, it doesn't change the truth. It doesn't change what the Word of God said. We owe Him everything. Absolutely everything. Without God in our lives, without God's salvation. There's no meaning. There's no purpose to life. Life is pointless and hopeless and without meaning. God gives purpose and meaning to our lives. Maybe like Paul, ever be aware of the fact Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 and 10, by the grace of God I am what I am. Sinners saved by grace. May that teach us why God has the right to issue any command to us that He chooses. May we be like Isaiah in chapter 6 when he had the vision of God. Here I am, send me, he said. The king had died. Josiah had reigned for 52 years. He was dead. But friends, the true king was alive. Isaiah got this vision of a God who would never die. He was the true king. And that's why he had that vision. And would to God, I could have that vision. Every one of us could have that vision. The kings come and go. The mortal men come and go. Obama and Cameron and all the rest of them, they go. They will be gone. But God remains the same. He's the true eternal king. We are told that these bodies are to be presented as a living sacrifice. Now, sacrifices are not normally living. It sounds dreadfully painful to us because we know that a sacrifice in the Bible was something that had to die Its blood was shed. Its flesh was burned on an altar. It doesn't seem like something that we'd want to get involved in, does it? 
It doesn't sound very attractive that we would want to get involved in a sacrifice, in a human sacrifice. The difference, the difference. Their sacrifice was to die. Our sacrifice is to live. While that is true now, just as then, the sacrifice the Lord is commanding each of us to make is costly, it's painful, it's difficult, it's personal, but it's necessary. And you see, friends, we realize that today as we sit and we listen. It's costly, it's painful, it's difficult, it's personal. We realize that because it's so difficult Because if every one of us had given our lives on the altar to God, what a change that would make in our own personal lives, in the lives of our families, in the life of this church, in the life of this nation. Basically, God is commanding every one of His people. You see, if you're a Christian this morning, if you're saved, this command is to you. It's not just to some super saints. It's not just to those who are in leadership in the church, those who are involved in something in the church. It's to you, brother. It's to you, sister, this morning. At the same time, this sacrifice must continue. It's given, but it must continue to function. Once we give this sacrifice, we must function in this world in which we live. Because we're... These are all living, yes? Good, good. A living sacrifice means that we are to be on the altar wherever we are. Regardless of the geographical surroundings, we are to remember that this body and all it is belongs to God. There is never an instant in life when we are out of the view, out of His view, or free to live as we please. It has to be on the altar all of the time. A living sacrifice means a constant, continuous sacrifice. This is not something we do from time to time when we take a notion. Oh, I'll give my life to the Lord. I'll, I'll, you know, no, it's continuous. A living sacrifice means that the body sacrifices its own. We come to a difficult part here, don't we? I know it's difficult for me. A living sacrifice means that the body sacrifices its own desires for those of God. To be a living sacrifice will require that the body does not live for the world, the flesh, or the devil but that everything the body does is held to the guidelines of the Word of God. Difficult. A living sacrifice means that the body is devoted to the task of serving God. Are we? We've got to ask ourselves these questions, every one of us. Are we devoted to the service of God? Is that the number one thing in our lives? This means that we are to lay down the ambitions and desires of the body and commit ourselves to doing nothing but that which God bids us to do. We are to be as vessels through which He can live and work in this world. The bottom line of all this is sacrifice in the, of the body is not just something we do in church. I think, you know, sometimes we're good at that too, aren't we? We have a church persona, and then we have a persona for during the week from Monday to Saturday. It should all be the same but implies that every action and activity that the body engages, everything that we engage in, is an activity that should glorify and honor God. If it doesn't glorify God, if it doesn't honor God, then we shouldn't be involved in it. It's as simple as that. The sacrificed body sees itself as the temple of God. And we're told that in Scripture. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. It realizes that God must be in absolute control of the will. Emotions, passions, deeds, and the thoughts of the body. All rights are released and the body is delivered to God to do with as it pleases Him. And you know, when I keep saying the body, friends, keep in mind, we're not just talking about the physical body. We're talking about ourselves, the real you, all the faculties, all that we are. We come back to it again. This is our spiritual act of worship. This is the highest form of worship that we can be involved in, giving our lives as a living sacrifice to God. The Bible, every one of the versions that we've read, says it should be a holy uh, sacrifice, something consecrated, something set apart. It should be acceptable to God, well-pleasing, satisfying. The idea here is when the life is totally sold out, separated, and sacrificed to God, it will be an awe-inspiring thing. It will demonstrate the power of God like nothing else. 
And friends, we, you know, we look to missionaries and you know, people that have sold themselves to serve God. They've given up everything and they've moved to a foreign country where they maybe have next door to none. They've given it all up to serve God. Now, we don't all need to move to the mission field. But friends, we don't have to because here where we are is a mission field. The people here in Northern Ireland are as ignorant of God's Word and the Gospel as the people out in the far-flung places in Africa and in South America. And if you don't realize that, something badly wrong. So we can be sold out, but it will demonstrate God's power, a life sold out for God. God could do more in a church with one properly sacrificed life than He could with a hundred who were half-heartedly playing the church game. Friends, we've got to ask ourselves these questions. They're not comfortable questions, but I have to ask myself, am I just playing the church game? Am I just going through the formality and the process of coming along to meetings? And Is that all it is? A question for thought. How much awe do our lives inspire when people see us? When they see the way we live, are they inspired? Do they look and say, God's in that person's life because they're sold out for Him? It has to be acceptable. It has to be well-pleasing to Him. The time is flying on. The clock's your worst enemy. But I'm only halfway through, so don't, 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 don't panic. Okay. Uh, it honors Him. We've already said it and we say it again. It honors Him like nothing else can. This life, this body sacrificed on the altar of God's service. It proves its power. It shows its glory. It tells a lost world that God makes a difference in the lives He touches by His power. You know, if God doesn't make a difference in our life, what's the point of the gospel? What's the point of it all? If God doesn't make a difference, if you witness to somebody and they say, well, I have enough problems of my own without yours. Our lives should be different. The sad truth of the matter is this. We're either pleasing God I am either pleasing God or I'm hurting Him by the way I use my body, my life. And that's true of us all. We're either pleasing Him by the use we put put our bodies to or we are displeasing Him. If you want to please the Lord, then our bodies must be placed on His altar of service without reservation or hesitation. And it was said, the commands to everybody, not just to a few super saints, It's given to every member of the family of God. But for us to be able to present our bodies as an act of spiritual worship, something else has to happen. And here we get to the second part of it. Two things, in fact. One negative thing has to happen. One positive thing needs to happen. We read that in verse 2 of uh, Romans 12. The negative thing, do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world. The positive thing, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Let's look at the negative one. We are commanded, do not be conformed to this world. The word conform means to fashion or to shape. That's what it means, to fashion or to shape. It literally means to mold. And that's what Paul is trying to get across to us. Do not be molded, shaped into the shape of the world. Do not think like the world. Do not be conformed to this world and the way the world thinks and the way the world acts and the way the world does. The world wants to, now if we haven't realized this, we should have, the world wants to squeeze Christ out of our lives. But friends, we should allow Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit within us to squeeze the world out of us. That's the other way around. The world and those who are controlled by its influence are vastly different from which God intends men to be. It's made clear now, and we could read it, and we're not going to read it for the sake of time. It's made clear in the list of the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, 19 and 21. The world is diametrically opposed to God. The two cannot come together in any shape or form. They are diametrically opposed to one another. We are to avoid being squeezed into the world's mold. We must be seen to be different and remain different. 
And that doesn't mean that we should absolutely look different, that we're some sort of a foreign race or something. That's not what it means. But we are to be different people. If we are just living our lives the way the world lives their lives, if there's nothing different in our lives than the people in the world, then there's something wrong. There's absolutely something wrong. The positive one, the definition of transformation. The word transformed in our Bible, uh, it's translated transformed in our Bible, is the Greek word. Now, I, I pronounce this wrong. Metamorpho. But you, immediately, you'll, you'll, that's probably not pronounced right, but that doesn't matter. It literally means to change into another form. God wants you to change into another form. That's where we get our English word metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. Used to describe a change of form when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. That's why I ask you, you're still all looking at me amazed. That's why I asked you at the start, did you want to be a caterpillar or did you want to be a butterfly? That's what it's all about. Did you know that the caterpillar and the butterfly are the same creature? They're not two different creatures. And I didn't know that. You would think the caterpillar is one creature, the butterfly is another. They're the same creature. What happens when the caterpillar enters the cocoon and later emerges is that the part of the insect that resides on the end... Now, listen to this. The part of the insect that resides on the inside is allowed to be manifested on the outside. And surely that's what it's all about as far as Christians are concerned. What's in needs to come out. It needs to be shown. It It doesn't need to be covered up. And that's the idea there. We are to undergo, undergo, undergo a complete change which under the power of God will find expression in our character and our conduct. We are to be changed. We should be butterflies, not caterpillars. We who are caterpillars are to become butterflies. Know that Paul uses the passive word indicating transformation is something we allow. We can't do it for ourselves. We allow it to be done for us. Not something we can do by our own power alone. It has to be the work of God. It has to be the work of the Holy Spirit. Just the same if you're here this morning and you're not saved. You're not in a living relationship with God. You don't know Christ as your Savior. You can't change yourself. You can't suddenly take a notion, I'm going to get saved. Except the Holy Spirit draws you. Except the Holy Spirit does that work of regeneration within you. You can't be saved. You can't become born again. It's a fact. And friends, unless we allow God, the Holy Spirit, to change us, we're not going to be changed. How is it accomplished? By surrendering the will to God. That's the thing I find so difficult. Surrendering the will to God. We all have our own will, and we want to do this, and we want to do that, surrendering the will to God. By filling the mind with the Word of God, by filling the mind with the Word of God, are we people who read the Word of God? Do we read it daily? Do we meditate upon it? Do we study it? Or do we just have a wee Bible notes, and we just read a wee thing for the day? Do that by all means, but that's not studying the Bible. That's not meditating upon the Bible. But friends, that's the one way we're going to be changed, the way our minds are going to be changed. If we start studying, feeding, meditating upon the Word of God, we often say, we we like saying, it's the living Word of the living God. It's the Word, the Word of God that will change us. By ordering one's life after the teachings and commands of God, you see, it's simple really. I'm fast running out of time. What's the motivation for it all? And you know, it would take too much time. I I don't know, but sometimes that's the problem. You prepare far too much and you just haven't got the time. You just haven't got the time. And I I asked this morning, my prayer this morning was that the Holy Spirit would just show me what I should say and what I shouldn't say, what to leave out. And you know, we have such a blessed time in the men's prayer meeting on a Sunday morning. And you know, my prayer this morning before I come out here, out, of, out from home, was, you know, that God would confirm His Word to me. And you know, God confirmed His Word this morning in the prayer meeting. By the way, one brother prayed. It was, almost, it, was, it was almost my message. And you know, you can ask Denver, and very often that happens with him. 
And I know, and I, I thought to myself, well, you know, tell people that, and pe- some people, some people look at you blank, and they'll wonder what you're talking about, and all that. But friends, that's the way it works. That's the way the Holy Spirit works. If we want to be people who are filled with the Spirit, moving, walking in the Spirit, that's the way the Spirit works. And the Lord confirmed this word to me this morning. But there's far, far too much of it. I haven't time. It's time's going on. But the motivation is this, friends, is the mercies of God. Read. I'll just name these things. Freedom from sin. The gift of eternity. These are the things God has done for us. And because of these mercies of God, we ought to want to do this. Present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Be transformed. Freedom from sin. The gift of eternal life. Peace with God. Access to the grace of God. Saved from the wrath of God. Because of the love of Christ, all these things should motivate us to want to give everything we have to God. Unless there's a renewing of our mind, any change in our lives will be superficial. We need this renewal of the mind. And look, let's put it bluntly and let's put it simply. If we don't read the Word, if we don't study the Word, if we don't meditate upon God's Word, the mind can't be renewed. We need to put off the old man and we need to put on the new man. We need to live according to the Spirit of God. The process of transformation is simple, but maybe difficult in a way. Meditate and contemplate on God with His Word. Keep your mind in communication with God in prayer. Prayer is vital also. Involve your mind in spiritual worship via frequent assembling with others. We need one another. That's why we join together in the meetings of the church. We need one another. Center your mind on Christ as we even come around the table of the Lord. What do we center our minds on when we're partaking of these emblems? Are we concentrating our minds on what the Lord has done? Or are we thinking about what happened yesterday and what might happen tomorrow and all the rest of it? Finally, well, finally, Denver often says that, and it means nothing. But we're almost here. Finally, what hinders us so often? Can a mind be renewed on a starvation diet? No, it can't. What do I mean? Irregular Bible study. If you're not reading the Word, if you're not... And I'm sorry that I'm laboring this, but it's the truth. It's a fact. If you're not studying the Word of God, your mind cannot... You're on a starvation diet. Would you miss your breakfast? Well, some people do. Immediately I ask that question. Some people don't believe in having a breakfast. I know that. But would you miss your meals all of next week? Would you? Would you not... Would you make a conscious... Now, you could be fasting for it and all the rest. We know all that, but you know what I mean, friends. Would we miss our food, our physical food? Would we? Of course we wouldn't. But do we miss our spiritual food? Are there some of us just depending on the spiritual food that we get on a Sunday morning? Are you looking for your own spiritual food? Are you just depending on what's handed out from the pastor? You know, friends, these are the things, these are where the reality of life, this is where the rubber hits the road. This is reality. And you know, I could come this morning and I could prepare a lovely wee message about something and it would tickle us and and it would be nice and all the rest of it. And we'd all go out here and, you know, everything would be lovely. But I don't think that's what we need. That's not what I need either. Can a mind be renewed on junk, a junk food diet? TV, books, films. We feed our minds on the things of the world. Many Christians, they can tell you more about the soaps than they can about the Word of God. They could tell you far more about Carnation Street and Emmerdale and all those other things than they could tell you about the early church or the works of the Spirit or the gifts of the Spirit or any of these other things. Because they feed their minds on those things. And if Christians, as Christians, if we feed our minds in those things, is it any surprise that our minds are not renewed? I mean, is it, you know, is it any surprise? We're in a starvation diet. We're in a junk food diet. Why do we not experience transformation? We become what we think, and much of what we think upon is not becoming. 
Another question. What about our thought life? What about my thought life? What's, what's the things I think about? What are the things you think about? Maybe when you're alone or whatever, what are the things that are going through your mind? What do you think about? Well, do you know something? If you're a regular reader and study or meditator upon the Word of God, you'll be thinking about the Word of God. What about, you know, there's so much, friends, we can go into this morning. We spend more time watching things of the devil than reading things of the Spirit. Oh, no, we don't, do we? We spend more time watching things of the devil, things of this world, things that don't count. You know, we have often has been prayed, and we, we realize this, and I know many of us realize that, if not all of us, there's just far too much stuff in our lives that hinder God working, that hinder God moving. And that's the bottom line, friends. Not that stuff, not sinful stuff. We're not living an out-and-out sin. But then we've got to ask ourselves the question, if this stuff is blocking God moving in our lives and uh, blocking us being used for God, is it, does it not then become sin? We lose the spiritual battle for our minds so often by what we allow ourselves to be thinking about. And you know, we could sum it all up in a nutshell. That's the battles in the mind. That's where Satan wants to win the battle in your mind, even as a Christian. The attack, the battle, the war, the warfare is all about the mind. Our attitudes and behavior is but a reflection of what goes into our minds. It's as simple as that. If you feed your mind on the things of the world, is it any surprise that you think like the world? Now, is it? I know you don't normally answer. But, you know, just think about that. Whereas if we were thinking about the Word of God, we're concentrating our mind. And that doesn't mean, we need, that, doesn't mean that 24-7 you have to be reading the Bible. Come on, you know, I don't mean, and you know I don't mean that. There's other things in life that we can enjoy and all the rest of it. But we need to spend time in the Word. And then our attitudes and behavior will reflect what's in these minds. The conclusion... Now, this is, I'm over. I'm finished. I'm done. The conclusion is this. In light of God's wonderful grace, this is our spiritual act of worship, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice and be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Do you want to be a caterpillar or do you want to be a butterfly? I know it was a funny wee question and all the rest of it, but I, I hope that you see the significance of it. The caterpillar, the butterfly, it's the same insect, but the one, you know, that's what we need. We need this transformation. We need to be changed. And I just pray that by God's Spirit, He will bless this Word to each one of our hearts. Amen.